All right, what's the next food? All right, so I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm getting hungry. I, I think one of the most universally acclaimed and loved food would be bacon. Mm. I, oh, I, without right? a doubt. I yeah, mean, I mean, everybody does. So the Catholic Church bacon. created bacon. Yes. No. Heresy. 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 <laughs> no, but you know, of of the three major Abrahamic faiths, only Christianity, you know, allows the consumption of pork. Oh yeah. Mm. And you know why is that? I mean. I don't know. Probably hit the taste buds of another pope in history, and he says, "I baptized this. I pig. baptized this bacon." Well, Actually, wait a second. That's kind of true. Wait a second. But you know which pope it was? Put me on the gauntlet. Ooh. Pope Numero Uno. Really? Yeah. Oh, of Peter. course. Yeah. Yes. Hello, Saint Peter. What? That's so true, man. That's right. In the in the uh, experience of the angels lowering. The sheet with all the foods that in were Acts unclean. ten, Saint Peter had the vision where all the foods, of, you know, everything that was traditionally forbidden of Jews to eat, mm. um, you know, under the old covenant, the Gentiles ate it though, didn't they? They did, didn't they? yeah. Okay. But he had this vision of a large, you know, blanket. Uh, this called a you know picnic cloth coming down with all the foods, and you know, and he heard that uh, said, you know, get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. And Peter said, certainly not, sir. Which he called God sir, which I always thought was kind of, yeah. you know, strange. Hi, sir. <laughs> and he said, you know, I've never eaten anything profane or unclean. And the voice said to him again, what God has made clean, you are not to call profane. So God right there was giving the first pope a vision saying, I am making this food clean. Mm. And that really, you know. Thank you, Jesus. Th thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for this. Let's have a moment of silence. <laughs> yeah. Father, we lead us in a prayer. Thank you. Mm. Father, all right. Thank you. Lead us in a prayer thanking Jesus for bacon from heaven in Acts 10. Ready? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, thank you so much for the gift of bacon because mm. I love bacon and I love it when it's extra crispy. Extra crispy bacon is the best thing since sliced bread. But when you put it on a piece of sliced bread, mm. Mm. with a little bit of mayo and a little bit of lettuce. It's a burger. Thank a little you, bit Jesus. of tomato. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Good. And it's true. You know, this whole concept of God making clean, you know, and, and this uh, do not call anything, anything impure that God has made clean. You know, when we look to our neighbor and we look to the people in our own churches, every time that we enter into a liturgy, we beseech God for his mercy. And it starts with a penitential act and yep. a minor absolution. And God, by nature of our baptism, is renewing our baptism and he's constantly making us clean. And we can't turn to our brothers and sisters and ridicule them and, and enter into poor relationships with them and, and stay in that divided sense of, of uh, our relationship. We have an obligation as Catholics, as baptized members of the body of Christ, to recognize the goodness of our brothers and sisters, recognize the goodness of what God is making clean. And what God is making clean is so many things. So not only just the food, but also our, our neighbor and, you know, our family members and so much of God's work. Do you think is, God can make um, my neighbor clean up his yard, dude? He's got <laughs> truck parts everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's bad, dude. I want to sell my house and I can't because I look over and it's just like, it looks like, you know, junk. Your property volume is just Oh, and he's a nice guy. He's a nice Sanford guy. And, and I don't sons. want to be like, dude, you got to move your stuff. But, you know, can you throw in one of those priestly prayers that he makes my neighbor Look clean? Look past all of that. Oh, junk. so you're saying it's clean? <laughs> Look past the junk. That's right. Don't get caught I'll tell up. the realtor what, you know, what, you know, Father Rich has made clean. Don't call <laughs> unclean. Well... Oh, brothers. So, yeah, you know, that teaching also is, I think, an extension of what Jesus said in Matthew 15, that it's not what enters one's mouth that defiles a right. person, but what comes out of a mouth mm -hmm. that right. defiles a person. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the teaching in Acts 10 and Acts 15 at the First Council of Jerusalem really is the culmination of how the church took Christ's teaching on those types of things. And when we see dietary restrictions throughout the scriptures, but we also experience them in life, I spent some time in India, I spent some time in Israel, and the different dietary restrictions that are still present there in their cultures, it, it clearly creates a markation of 
who can be at table and who can, imp- you know, who can totally participate. Kind of and separates it's, yeah, the it's community. Separ- it's separation. And yeah. so much of communio, so much of what happens in our communion with one another should happen at the table. And we think of Jesus's ministry, a lot of his ministry, a greater majority mass. of his ministry happens around the table. Yeah, and the celebration right. of mass is that One meal. of my favorite icons is, is Rublev's, mm-hmm. uh, what is it? What is it called? Rublev's, uh, and it's got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit the Trinity, sitting yeah. at a table. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, you know, you're that chair yeah. right there. Yeah. Sit down. And you yeah. are welcome and you are invited. Yeah. And God is making our table clean so that we can cross the boundaries of what has d- divided us for so many years. And we think about Orthodox Jews and we think about um, the Gentiles of that time, that this essentially broke down a huge barrier of practice of meal. That's right. Yeah. So it's it's awesome to think of that, but there's other boundaries that are in our world today that we need to break down as well and start joining together in meal and celebrating the gift of life that God has given us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well you, said. Yeah. You know, and, and like another thing to think about is that a lot of people you'll see like uh, maybe kind of anti-Christians or kind of like the new atheists online. One of the things they really like to bring up is, well, Oh, well, the Old Testament says you shall not eat shellfish. And they're like, well, you eat shrimp, so ha, 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 I got you. Or you shall not wear clothes of mixed fabric. And, you know, what they don't understand is that, you know, rules, there, there's certain rules that are timeless and there's other rules that really are societal laws, even within the Bible and within the Old Testament. And that they th- they think that God is putting these rules in because God doesn't want you to eat something or whatever. God doesn't make rules for himself. He doesn't need to. These rules and all these things are for people. They're not for themselves. They're for the people in a particular time and place. God doesn't need anything. He's doing things that are for your own benefit. Right. He's putting rules and restrictions on you for your own benefit. It's like, you know, a, uh, a speed limit on a freeway. The road doesn't need it. The road doesn't, the road is indifferent to how fast you travel. And that's the excuse I use when I speed. That's right. It is. <laughs> we don't need these stupid signs. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Well, no, the, and, and in a certain sense, laws are arbitrary down to its very fundamental right. basis. Yeah. But the the use of law is and the purpose is to govern us in love. That that's ultimately where it's guiding us, that there's a harmony in our in our livelihood, and that we are careful enough for one another to not break a law and potentially hurt another person. That's right. So we look at the Decalogue. You know, these are the laws that were given by God. And we look at the first three and the remaining seven. The first three re- relate to God. Yeah. And then the remaining seven relate to how we relate with one another. And ultimately, the effect of observing these laws is so that we may be governed in love and come into greater communion with one another. Right. Right.